Um, we've got well-rounded guests today. Uh, if you don't know them already, uh, check out the chat box for places to follow them uh, on social media. Uh, we'll be hitting on topics specific to each location with each of them. And then we'll kind of, as we always do, wrap up uh, with submitted questions. And if you have any questions as we are chatting, feel free to either put them in the chat box for everybody. You can direct message me. I'm happy to ask on your behalf. Uh, or I'll just prompt you and you can ask yourself. Um, so with that, let's jump into things. We are going to uh, talk with our four panelists. Uh, Lucy, we will start with you, order of appearance. We've got Lucy, Matt, Lars, Dom, no pressure. Um, but Lucy, let's start with you. Uh, you are coming to us uh, on the road, uh, but normally based out of Cape Town, South Africa. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned to me as we were kind of talking about um, some topics for today was the idea of South African brewers trying to create a uniquely South Africa style. Um, what's going on there that we can learn more about? Hi, good evening, everyone. It is evening here. That's why I'm drinking beer. Although I was drinking beer this morning as well, so that's not really an excuse. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's actually cool stuff going on for a long time. I mean, our craft beer scene here kind of kicked off about 10 years ago. Um, and for the longest time, originally it was um, following German style. So every brewery had a vice beer, um, you know, and it was sort of trying to follow German styles and maybe Irish styles a little bit and then moved on to American styles. And it's taken a long time, I think, for brewers to sort of almost get the confidence to come um, up with South Africa. And um, we've tried different, going down different routes using all South African ingredients, for example, we do grow hops and we do have, you know, grow, grow, grow and malt barley, but the barley in particular is not like the greatest, let's say. So using all South African ingredients isn't necessarily the best way, the way to make the best beer. Um, and then we had this phase of people trying to use really uniquely South African stuff. So whether that was, so we, we have, um, around Cape Town in particular, it's one of the world's floral kingdoms. And we have like a huge uh, biodiversity, um, um, the a plant called Fainbos. Um, and they've, a lot of them are very sort of fragrant. So people tried using those and rooibos, which I think a lot of people will have heard of is the redbush red bush tea and trying to use that. I mean, I love rooibos and I love beer, but not necessarily in the same glass. So that didn't really work out so well, in my opinion anyway. But what's have been happening in the past couple of years is uh, trying to marry traditional um, African beer, which is usually sorghum or millet based, with craft beer. So traditional African beer is sort of um, uh, a, an endangered species, let's say. People are not brewing it as much as they used to. It's really only for sort of traditional ceremonies and weddings and such. And some of the craft brewers are trying to modernize it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very it's very, very different to beer as we generally are um, thinking of beer. So it's um, hazier than any New England IPA you've ever seen. You know, it's completely opaque. Uh, it's uncarbonated. It's um, milky and sour and low ABV, usually around 2%. So it's, it's quite an unusual and very barnyardy, farmyardy and um, uh, unfiltered to the point where it's actually got particles of grain still suspended. Uh, chewy is the word you would use, um, but literally chewy, not just like it's got full body rabbits, like literally you, you are chewing it. So it's quite a, a it, it's a bit of a stretch for a lot of people. Um, so what people have been doing is, is trying to find ways to incorporate that into craft beer. So we've had a few people, for example, there's a brewery in the, in the Cape Winelands and they brewed a batch of the traditional beer, which is called Umkomboti. I can't get the click right. Let me try that again. Umkomboti. Um, so he, he brewed the traditional sorghum beer and then afterwards blended it with his, with one of his, um, he does like a wild, he specializes in wild ferments and then aged that in a barrel. So that, you know, it's, it's um, a beer that you would describe as interesting. <laughs> Not necessarily something you're sitting drinking pints of. And then yesterday, in fact, because I'm on the road traveling around at the moment, and I popped into a brewery yesterday, and um, a guy from another brewery came in. I've actually got a bottle of it here, and he's called it Ibia, which is um, beer in Tosa, um, which is one of the in, in languages, official languages of South Africa. And he's done a similar thing where he made the sorghum beer, 
and then blended, but he didn't ferment it. He, he made the sour mash and then blended that with, I want to say pale ale, I've got it written down somewhere. I haven't tasted it yet. I'm a little bit nervous about it being out of the fridge, if I'm honest. <laughs> I'm just going to move it away from my laptop. <laughs> you just never know. So yeah, it, it's just, it's really, there's like cool stuff that, um, you know, using sorghum in, in craft beers as well. So there's one guy who does a saison with 40% sorghum. So yeah, it's just trying to marry that traditional African beer with um, modern craft. Um, Lucy, uh, as as we're talking or, or after we're done, if there are particular breweries who are doing this that you might be able to share in the chat box for people to click over and find, that would be wonderful just so we know where some of this is happening. For, for a beer style like this, like, so you said this is hard to convince people maybe that this is in the normal wheel, wheelhouse of beer. So what are some of the things that these breweries are doing to maybe uh maybe modernize maybe make more contemporary or just more uh more easy or easier for people to to kind of uh to drink and enjoy i think the big thing is that it's that it's filtered because the traditional beer is not filtered um so the big thing is that it's filtered and um and carbonated and chilled because the traditional beer is it's literally it takes about five days to brew it and it's drunk on day six uh it's drunk while actively fermenting and it's um, it's served yeah room temperature ish or mm. um, and and uncarbonated so all of these things together you know flavor wise it's not such a stretch for someone who's used to use the experiments with craft beer because it's it's got Brettanomyces and it's it's a lactic ferment so you know it's like it's not um, flavor wise it's not uh, so unusual you know to to people who are experimenting with craft beers but texture wise. It's a, I think it's an issue for people because um, it's this sort of weird color. It's sort of a grayish pinkish color. <laughs> and um, and yeah, and then because it's served completely unfiltered, it's literally put through basically sort of a rudimentary sieve. Um, so one of the main things that people are trying to do is, yeah, um, blending it maybe with a barley based beer as well, and then filtering and carbonating it at least a little to make it seem a little bit more familiar. Let's say. Um, I don't know if this will be something that uh, brewers will be entering into the African Beer Cup, um, but that is a competition that's coming up soon. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with the African Beer Cup and and uh, maybe some things that would be interesting to the other writers here? Yeah, so this is actually my, my competition. I started it with my husband uh, three years ago, but this is actually, no, so four years ago, but this will be the third year because in 2020, we had to cancel, of course. That was canceled. Um, so there are a couple of, of beer, other beer competitions in South Africa, but this is the only competition that's open to breweries across Africa. The other ones are only for South African breweries. The first year we did it, we thought if we can just get one entry from outside South Africa, we'd be thrilled because then it would be Africa. And the very first entry in the first year was actually from the DRC, from the Democratic Republic. And we got, I think, 10 different countries. We had 12 countries last year. So the entries come from all across, at least sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we had, last year we had just over 200 entries. And we actually, we, was expect, we were expecting a fall because we've had a lot of problems through COVID with alcohol bans and all sorts, and a lot of breweries have closed. So, but we actually had an increase, quite a large increase from the previous competition. Um, so yeah, we we have it's it's open to any brewery. So um, Heineken, for example, entered some of their beers. Heineken, huge uh, across Africa, and ABI entered quite a lot of their beers. But so it's craft brewers, uh, nano brewers, and then right up to the the, the major brewers. We it's we use the BJCP guidelines. So for the most part, you know, a lot of the, the, the most entered style, I think a lot of our judges, of which I see at least one here, because um, this is the first year we're having international judges join us as well, because um, we're still a new and a very small competition. Um, and I think some of the judges are expecting a lot of, I remember one of the judges on Facebook saying, he's looking forward to uh, a pinotage barrel aged sorghum and millet something mm -hmm. something and I'm like oh you might be a bit disappointed because our two most centered categories are international pale lager and uh, American pale ale <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we do have some interesting beers we have a special award which is sponsored by the Beer Association of South Africa 
which is called the African Celebration Award, which is for the, the highest scoring beer in the competition that showcases uh, African ingredients. So last year that was won by a Nigerian microbrewery. Um, they had entered an imperial stout with sorghum and uh, a Nigerian coffee, um, which won a gold medal and then won the African Celebration Award. So yeah, we do, a lot of the smaller breweries are trying certainly to use um, local ingredients and whether that's the grains or, you know, a lot of um, herbs and spices and fruits. So there will be something um, interesting for the judges, I hope. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll, uh, we'll move on to, to Matt in just a moment, but, but Lucy, it sounds like whether it is this uh, effort to try to find a uniquely South Africa, African style for South Africa, or looking across these entries that you're getting from across the continent, that there is a larger effort being made to focus more on unique ingredients that are native to these places to make it more African in the way that it's represented in flavor and taste. Yeah, I mean, I think we're just trying to find like our beer identity now, certainly in South Africa. Some of the microbreweries in other um, African countries are doing a really good job of it. Um, Bature, which is a brewery in, in Nigeria, um, they use sorghum in all of their beers. And, you know, they try and, and utilize other sort of uh, fruits that are um, unique to, to Nigeria as well. There's also a brewery in Kenya that's doing something similar. Um, so, yeah, I think South Africa is... Um, by far the has the you know the biggest craft beer culture on the continent but um it's taken a few years for it to kind of i don't know feel comfortable doing something a little different and not just fo following um global beer trends it's exciting times uh global beer trends something that we'll come back to and i i will make a plug right here this is on our blog we have a list of paying publications where you can pitch and uh, Lucy had submitted uh, this blurb for ONTAP magazine, uh, for which Lucy uh, edits as well. So I'm flagging this. Uh, if, you know, things that you're working on may be applicable, uh, Lucy's contact is here as well. Um, and she can share her things, in, her contact in the chat box. Um, right below, fittingly enough, uh, Pellicle, uh, <laughs> of which um, I will flag both uh, Matt Curtis's uh, information about ways to pitch, style guide, as well as um, this is something that we love to see, Matt, um, that starting in May, uh, rates will be updated. Um, Matt, I'm going to um, kick it over to you because while there's a bunch of stuff uh, in the UK I want to ask about, we'll talk about a few of them. Uh, you're celebrate, you were celebrated recently with an award for Pellicle, um, as well as celebrating a birthday. Can you maybe just, for those who maybe haven't read anything in Pellicle, can you just give a, a quick little rundown of, of what your publication is? Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Brian. Thank you. Um, cheers. It's four o'clock here in the UK, um, and I'm fittingly drinking a beer from St. Mars of the Desert called Jack Daw that's just been released for the spring. Some of you may remember this uh, Pretty Things beer from back in the day. Well, we have it now and it's uh, tasting as good as ever. Uh, so thank you for that wonderful gift uh, of Dan and Martha uh, in Sheffield. We're very happy with that. Um, Pellicle is um, a magazine I started with a very good friend of mine called Johnny Hamilton. Uh, Johnny is a brewer. Um, he's actually a uh, Harriet Watt Masters uh, trained uh, he's got a degree in brewing and distilling, uh, but he's he's had many jobs as a shift brewer to a brewer running a barrel program and playing with yeasts. And he's now at a brewery up in uh, Edinburgh called New Barns, doing some really exciting things with heritage grain. Um, but he came to me with an idea about he had this handful of wine magazines and said, I wish we could do something like this, but for beer in the UK. And uh, I, I said, that's a great idea. Let's let's do it. So um, I managed to cobble together a business plan, get enough investment to pay for six months of costs based on paying writers, because that was I'm a freelance writer and I really wanted to build a platform. I'm very lucky. I was a blogger that was kind of brought into this world of beer writing, was able to make it a career, but it's very challenging to do that. And I um, I really wanted to build a platform to enable the, the not just publishing stories, but paying writers to do those stories in the UK. I would say beer writing is maybe not as established here uh, in the UK as it is in the US in terms of the number of publications and the number of writers. Um, however, um, 
so we started this magazine with a with a consumer focus um and at the start of this year i looked at it as a freelancer and thought what would i want to be paid am i paying enough um and i thought no i think we really need to look at it a lot of other publications i freelance for were putting up their rates so um we kind of budgeted but went a little bit further than we thought we needed to um because you know the cost of living is is you know if we're going to talk about brewing in the uk we have a an energy crisis we have brexit we have so many things that are making the production and sale of beer uh, significantly more expensive and writing about it is also part of that so that rate increase um is is also hopefully going to help uh keep keep things going but also keep the, our contributors invested in what we're doing um and keep the quality of what we're doing uh as high as possible. So we'll celebrate our third birthday on the 1st of May. Um, but last year, we, Johnny and I were able to bring two other people into our little editorial team, uh, Lily Waite and Katie Mather, two exceptionally uh, talented writers, two very busy people, um, but good friends of mine who I just rang and said, do you, do you wanna like help us with this? Because Johnny and I thought like, if it's just us two, we're gonna, we're gonna pigeonhole ourselves and produce a certain type of story we need to broaden uh, the ideas and thinking. So Katie and Lily have brought that to the table. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very convivial, uh, you know, we're all busy trying to earn a living, doing something else, but, and then we sort of dip in and out to Pellicle. Well, they do. I'm like constantly obsessed with it. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a real pet project of mine. Um, and we also expanded into a podcast last year as well, uh, which is up to 30 episodes now. So yeah, very happy with how that's going. And uh, we were awarded by the Society of Independent Brewers, which is our version of the Brewers Association, for being uh, the best independent craft beer promotion, which means they, th they thought we are the best at promoting small brewers in the UK uh, this year, which is, which is a cool thing. Um, Matt, there's a lot, like you had said, that's going on in the UK in terms of news to cover. Uh, we'll hit on maybe a couple items quickly here, and then we can come back when we open up the conversation as well. But um, I imagine many people here may have followed along to some degree with everything with BrewDog over the course of the last several months. Um, we don't need to recap the whole thing. I'll do a, a very dirty version of it right now, which is basically, you know, they, their former employees, um, who came out, spoke about uh, toxic workplace environment, uh, inappropriate behaviors of the owners. Um, there were uh, investigations by the BBC, uh, The Guardian, both in the UK. Um, most recently, James Watt, one of the co-founders, was found to have hired private investigators to investigate former employees. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Um, and so for, for us, uh, you know, maybe in North America, we kind of get a glimpse of it uh, from our own perspective and the way that the news trickles out. But I was curious being, you know, closer to the story and having covered as well BrewDog and covered this story itself over the course of the last several months. Um, what are the things that have stood out the most to you in terms of this story and the way it's evolved? I think what's interesting is that, you know, I'm very engaged in the BrewDog discussion online, but it's happening in such a small group of people. And BrewDog is is essentially like a craft beer McDonald's now um, in the UK. They've got bars in every city. They The bars used to have a very individual character and they've been remodeled where you can travel around the UK and they have they look they have the same furniture, the same vibe. In fact, they don't have vibe um, They they are very feel very much like a, a big chain and they're a big company. Um, but the interesting thing is that, um, so I reported, uh, it was, I think it was 2017, they took this 22% investment from TSG con consumer partners um, in the US and valued themselves at a billion. Um, and now they value themselves at 2 billion. Uh, I, think that's I think that's dollars, um, not pounds, but don't quote me on that. Um, and they are looking to uh, do an init initial public offering and float on the stock exchange um, and if you watch the BBC documentary there is a Vim it is in the UK but there is a Vimeo link you can watch it um, elsewhere uh, in in that um, they had created a special uh, C share for the TSG partners and are paying them a huge return so everything they're doing 
they basically have a year. They have till uh, the end of the next financial year, so the 31st uh, of March uh, 2023, to, to basically pay back TSG. Um, that's that's what's happening. So everything they're doing uh, is trying to, to boost this valuation because the bigger the valuation, the more money they will be able to pay to TSG. If they default on that, then TSG will be able to take significant control of the company and influence the direction where, where it's going. So um, on, it's very weird, like Brewdog, you talk about a lot of UK breweries, even some of the traditional family brewers or some of the more popular craft brewers, but Brewdog have kind of transcended that. They are a, this nationally recognized brand. They are constantly um, joked about by comedians on, on, on yeah. national news and sketch shows. That's, you know, and the, everything they do reflects on beer culture as a whole now. So while they're looking bad, they are making a lot of new breweries look, looking bad without them even really doing anything because people outside of of beer just look at Brudo and go, well, that's what craft beer is like. 5,000 ex employees since they were founded in 2007. That's a lot of people through the turnstiles. You know, it, it, it's um, it's pretty exhausting. So everything, all this focus is on um, what's happening uh, with that. But uh, and and then in terms of the more detail of the news, uh, they're trying to. Uh, ignore or create a narrative that kind of uh, disowns this criticism and uh, in many cases flat out denies it. Um, we're currently in the midst of, uh, I believe it's day 12 of Quotesgate. Um, the, the activist Fanny Wandel uh, on Instagram who's doing, I've got to give her a shout out, she's doing incredible work. The energy that would require to deal with some of the shit you must be seeing. Um, there is a quote that has been attributed to multiple sources. Um, uh, and many of those have refuted the quotes um, and we're trying to find out if it was actually quoted, if it was made up uh, and get an honest answer. That's the problem. Um, most beer writers like myself probably wouldn't get an interview <laughs> with them anymore. They, they, they speak to the press through statements sent through PR agencies now. You cannot, you know, and this is, this is someone who has sat in his office twice and interviewed him face to face. Um, and uh, so it's, it's very bizarre. They, Brewdog really did change the beer industry in the UK, largely, you know, back in the day for the better. They, they brought a lot of energy and excitement into it. And now I think they're doing quite a lot of damage to it, um, unfortunately. Uh, and I, I just want them to pull themselves together because uh, it would make my job a lot easier. But not just for me, but for, the, for, for all of these people who are clearly quite significantly affected, affected years on. We could do an hour on Brewdog. Uh, let's not. <laughs> but it's complicated. Um, we're working through it. Let's, um, uh, Matt, I want to come back to you to talk maybe about um, the alcohol tax system. I want to jump to Lars just to keep things flowing. So um, because that is something that will be uniquely for the UK and this broader problem that a lot of people will be facing um, that all of us can be mindful of. Um, Lars, um, I imagine people might recognize you in your work. Um, this is kind of like a, a culminating piece. Uh, this was a book that came out as part of the Brewers Publications, uh, Historical Brewing Techniques. Um, Lars is responsible for basically most of the conversation that we've had over the last few years about um, traditional historical farmhouse brewing. Um, particularly uh, the way that Lars has um, written and blogged about Norwegian farmhouse ale. Um, can we start there, Lars, and just when we say Norwegian farmhouse ale, um, share with people what that means exactly? Well, um, the, I guess the easiest way to explain it is that um, historically in Norway, people made their living simply by growing grain and then eating it that's what pretty much every Norwegian outside of the tiny towns was doing and when you do that of course in the autumn when you when you've taken in the harvest you have everything you need to make a beer and all of the farms did that so they had their own yeast they used their own barley that they malted uh, they would have hops growing along the wall and uh, they would also be using juniper which they just found in the forest um, but this was, it's kind of like Lucy was saying, it's, it was, it's quite far removed from modern beer, although not as far as, as the South African version, um, because it was based on uh, basically knowledge that was handed over through many, many, many generations. 
Um, and uh, now as we're kind of like entering whatever this next stage of pandemic life is, one of the things that is returning um, is Norwegian Farmers Ale Festival. Um, so, you know, it's gone from, I guess, what kind of is or was a, a niche thing to a big enough uh, big enough interest that it has its own festival. What is what is this festival? And, and tell us a little bit about um, how big it is and what it offers to people. Um, it's not a huge festival. We can start there. Uh, uh -huh. It's in Hornendal in, in Western Norway, which is a really an out of the way sort of place. Um, it's, it's quite deep into the country, so it's, it's a bit tricky to get to, but that's why there is a lot of farmhouse brewing in that specific area. So it, it takes place in the, in the gym hall of the local school. Um, maybe 300 people come. Um, and you always get a combination of uh, the traditional real farmhouse brewers who are sitting there with dried chips of their family quake that they hand out to everyone. Uh, and you can try their beers and you can talk to them. Um, and then there's often uh, modern home brewers who are kind of learning how to brew traditional farmhouse ale. And you can, uh, you can talk as well. Uh, and then we have talks. So we, we've had uh, quite a variety. We had uh, Richard Fries from Escarpment Labs one year. We had a professor from Carlsberg. Uh, we had a Norwegian hop grower. So there's, there's been quite a lot of that. Um, and we also do demo brewing. So you can uh, you can pay a little extra and come uh, on the morning before the festival and see a whole day of traditional farmhouse brewing with the real guys in the real brew house and, and stuff like that. Uh, and I think also, I, I think it's an important event because it's the it's basically your only chance to try the real farmhouse ale as, as it's actually made. Um, and also probably your only chance to actually talk to these people. Uh, but I think you also get an, uh, more of an understanding of it once you see the landscape and once you see the place. I was talking a lot with Richard Priest about, uh, you know, the geography and the different yeasts and why they were different, even though to him as a Canadian, it seemed like everything was, was from pretty much the same place. And then in, in the bus, before we even got to the festival, he was looking at the mountains and going, ah, I see now. Yeah, what is it? I mean, that's, that's a great point. Like, what is it that we miss? When, you know, we can read the words, uh, you know, on your blog or read your book and listen to people talk about it. But when we think about the uniqueness of what this kind of beer is, what is it that we're missing that you might be able to clue us in on a little bit? Well, I guess you have to sort of see that landscape for yourself to mm -hmm. sort of understand it. Uh, it's, it doesn't have any flat places. Quite simply, it's, I mean, it's all, you can think of it as, as uh, you know, 500 kilometers of mountains. There's somebody who's scooped out valleys in. So in, in um, my mother comes from this area and, and in their dialect, you, you don't talk about north or south or east or west because it's, it's irrelevant to you. You know, you can't move in a straight line anyway. Uh, so in fact, the main directions that they use is forwards and backwards in the valley because that's where you will be going unless you want to climb a thousand meters up and then, you know, cross the mountains and a thousand meters down again. What is the, um, you kind of hinted at talking about this festival, the way that some new uh, businesses or more established breweries are kind of, are making their own interpretations of Norwegian farmhouse ale. Uh, what is that influence? So we're talking about this event where people can have the real thing probably for the first time, but that influence extended, obviously. So what's the balance that's existing right now between what that traditional Norwegian farmhouse ale is to the way that maybe new or contemporary breweries are thinking about ways to bring that into what they do? So um, there's kind of, I guess there's two main ways that the, the modern brewers are relating to this. And one, one is the obvious where you you try to brew the traditional beer and you make some compromises, which you kind of inevitably have to do. Uh, one thing is, is this, um, the traditional beer is almost without CO2. Mm. Uh, and in fact, normally when you would serve it in a way that would cause it to ferment as it's being served. 
So it's a little bit like cost scale, but we don't have any infrastructure for serving beer that way. And if you if you serve it to a, a modern consumer, they're like, hey, this beer is off. It's like flat. They, they don't understand it at all. Um, but there is there is a good bit of that. And, and the festival has actually been helpful in this because it's uh, allowed the commercial brewers to meet the traditional brewers, try their beer, talk to them and, and learn. Uh, so that's actually been quite important. But then uh, the other way that they're using it is that they're taking both ingredients and techniques from the traditional brewing and, and using it in modern beers. Uh, so Nög Nö, which, which is a brewery a lot of people have heard of, uh, just brought out a, um, a pale ale that's, that's quite low alcohol, uh, where they didn't boil the wort in order to keep proteins in it so that it would have a, a fuller mouthfeel and a rounder mouthfeel. Uh, and they're also using crack. So they are kind of, and they, it doesn't say this on the label. This is just tricks that they are using to, to get the flavor that they want and, and, and people don't even know that it's happening, which is quite interesting. Um, one more thing before we, we talk with Don for a moment too, you would flag this that, um, so speaking of things that brewers are doing, there is an attempt to change right now in Norway, a limit of uh, 4.7 ABV for beer sold from breweries. Could you give us a quick rundown on, on what that movement is? Yeah, this is a little complicated. So, so um, in, in the Scandinavian countries, apart from Denmark, we have this thing where uh, strong alcohol is sold via government monopoly stores. So in a grocery store, you can only get stuff that's 4.7 or below. Uh, and because of this, when a brewery is selling beer, they can only sell stuff that's 4.7 or below. Which if you want to, you know, if you're a farmhouse brewer, you get a license and you want to sell your beer. That's a huge problem because none of these styles are below 4.7, not even remotely. Uh, if you served a beer that strength in, uh, from a Norwegian farm, people would talk shit about you for generations, literally. Um, so uh, the trouble here is uh, Norwegian government has said, no, no, we can't change these rules uh, because of uh, deals that we have made with the EU. Uh, but the Finns allow this and they have the same deals. So this is obviously wrong. And... Um, both the Brewers Association uh, and also people trying to promote farmhouse ale are trying to have this change because uh, for anyone who wants to set up a, bis a smaller business selling farmhouse ale, this would make a huge difference. So it, it would actually help us preserve the, the tradition and the culture. Hmm. Um, thank you for boiling it down <laughs> in, in, a, in a small way. Um, we can we can come back to that as well, Don. I, I want to jump over to you. Um, I know one of the things that that you have uh, been working to learn more and write about has been uh, malt malting process and all things therein. Um, you're coming to us uh, from Calgary uh, in Canada. Um, what, um, whether locally or in, across Canada, what is it about malt that's been catching your eye and ear lately? Um, what I think I'm super excited about is that, and, and I'm conscious that we have the executive director of the Craft Malters Guild on this call, so she's going to check everything I say. <laughs> but um, the the uh, Alberta is um, is uh, makes uh, grows at fifty percent of the uh, malting barley in Canada, and Canada is very much a malt barley export country. Um, Stone has been in the news the last day or so, and you know they. Um, most of their beer is brewed with the uh, Canadian barley. Um, all the big, all the big uh, American craft brewers, um, Sierra Nevada and New Belgium, they would be they would be brewing with Canadian um, and primarily Alberta barley. These um, um, the workhorse barley varieties in uh, are Copeland and Metcalf, and to a lesser extent Synergy. And these are the way. Um, uh, barley is grown, uh, the variety needs to be registered. Uh, and then they, and then it can be, um, seed companies can grow it up and the farmers can grow it. And Copeland was registered 20 years ago. Metcalf was registered 23 years ago. And um, uh, barley, the, the, the amount of time between breeding and registration is generally around 10 years. So if you think of Copeland and Metcalf being between 20 and 25 years old, the breeding of them started 30, 35 years ago. 
And if you think of what the beer industry looked like 35 years ago, uh, it doesn't look like it does, didn't look like it does now. My point being that Copeland and Metcalf are barley varieties that were bred for large multinational adjunct brewers. Um, and they have too much nitrogen, uh, they have too much nitrogen, they have too much protein. And I think what's really exciting uh, in, in craft malt and in, and in uh, uh, barley is that we're finally getting some barley varieties bred for craft brewers uh, uh, in terms of having better, uh, a lower enzymatic strength, um, lower protein levels. And then what gets me super excited about that then is if we're not, if farmers aren't restricted to growing Metcalf and Copeland, then farmers elsewhere can grow barley. Uh, the reason Alberta is such a great uh, a barley growing province is because we grow Copeland and Metcalf. But if we're growing other things, then you know farmers in in Ontario could grow it, uh, and uh, and all of a sudden. Uh, you have revival of agri agricultural communities, um, and uh, and I think that's super exciting. So if you think of you know what craft beer looked like 40 years ago, and where we've grown to now with 9,000 breweries in America and 1,200 breweries in Canada, I kind of think we're 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 seeing the same thing in barley. That 40 years from now, we might have you know, instead of, instead of RAR and, and country malt group being the dominant North American maltsters, we might have 100, 200,000 maltsters. I, you know, I don't know what the number is. And, and farmers growing barley malt, you know, everywhere. Um, Lucy mentioned, you know, that, that, that they grow um, malt in South Africa, but it's not the best. Well, it's because the variety that they're growing isn't necessarily suited to their climate, but if there was a variety that was suited to their climate, then they really could have South African barley that is of, of, of very high quality. Um, Don, as that starts to change, have you noticed conversation shifting or just uh, chatting with farmers who are expressing more interest in exploring, you know, I guess what might be more uh, boutique or more, uh, more smaller versions of, of uh, growing barley? Yeah, so there's a couple um, farmers here particularly that are working closely with breeders in, in um, pushing forward uh, new varieties. Farmers are uh, high, heavily invested in this because um, the agronomics, the economics of barley is actually not very good. Mm -hmm. um, as most people know, um, uh, farmers need to rotate their crops and barley is not the money crop. Uh, canola is the money crop and then they typically grow a pulse like a soybean or, or something uh, and um, part of the reason that barley is not the money crop is because uh, every new you know when people are breeding new varieties of, of soybean or canola or whatever the economics of it improves and because Copeland and Metcalf were 30 years old uh, their economics have stalled uh, mm. so uh, uh, Sorry, I, I sort of rambled there and I lost track of the question. Well, um, so I, I, maybe there's a, there's a good follow-up there too, though, because you know the, the way that you are breaking this down, um, this is not the first time on these calls for guild members that we have heard people either specifically talking about malt or organically talking about malt as something that can be seen as you know a next wave of some kind in the way that people think about, talk about, make beer. Why is it that this is something that's caught your attention in the way that it has? Um, well, I live in Alberta, first of all. <laughs> and then I just talk to these people who, who are passionate about it. And, uh, and it's just interesting, you know, I mean, um, I didn't realize that, that um, I, I live in a beer bubble and, uh, you know, the idea that, that barley and its economics is, is um, affected by canola is not something I would have thought of. And so um, as I'm learning these things, I, I just think it's, I just think it's really cool. Mm. Um, there is something with yeast too is, is going on. Uh, you had mentioned yeast as the, uh, another part of the, the ingredient chain uh, that's unique to Canada. What's, what's going on there? 
Yeah, so it's not that yeast is unique to Canada, obviously, but I think that uh, we are we uh, a couple of companies here are doing uh, very interesting things. Uh, and and Lars mentioned Richard uh, Priest. Um, he's uh, he's the lab director of a company here in Canada called Escarpment. And you know, for the longest time, uh, brewers were always proud of the purity of their yeast strain. You know, they would say that their that the beer was fermented with the Weinsteffner yeast or or West Mall yeast. Uh, and in the last few years, I think um, in part driven by Lars's work, um, North American brewers uh, started brewing with Kvik. Uh I think uh, Canada we took that on actually a lot more than uh, than American brewers. And that was super cool. But then what, uh, what Richard is doing is he's taking that and, and hybridizing new yeast strains. So rather than merely isolating existing yeast strains, he's creating new yeast strains through, through hybridization. And there are, there are one or two uh, labs in America that are, that are doing that as well. But what Richard is also doing, and, and he's certainly the only um, uh, yeast company I've interviewed um, that is doing this, is he's using something called adaptive lab adaptive lab evolution, I believe, um, to then take uh, his hybridized yeast strains and push them to do things that, um, that they wouldn't otherwise do. So for example, um, he's hybridized a Kvik strain and uh, used ale, uh, adaptive lab evolution, to create six, he, he had it evolve 60 generations. <laughs> so that it could better ferment um, maltotrios. And the point is to make uh, pseudo lagers that are clean and dry, uh, uh, but can ferment it at high temperatures. So where I live, we have a brewery that was making a premium lager. It would take them six weeks from mash in to packaging. And now using Richard's uh, hybridized and uh, uh, evolved yeast, from uh, from mash in to canning is ten days, huh. uh, and it's a clean lager, and it ferments hot. Uh, they, uh, you know, I live in Calgary. It gets to minus thirty in the winter here. They can they they can actually measure that they save money on their heating bill in the winter because the yeast ferments so hot. Uh, uh, they save money on their heating. <laughs> If that's not an anecdotal lead for someone's story, uh, Don, please use that in something soon. <laughs> that is, um, that's fantastic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause. Thank you to the four of you for we kind of the rapid fire walking through some of the the top high end things. Uh, I'm gonna pause for a second in case anybody on the call has interest in asking a question uh, to any of our four panelists for things that they've talked about or haven't. So uh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions, please feel free. I'll give that just a moment. This question sort of ties together Don and uh, Lars in some way. Uh, so for Lars, apart from uh, Nogane's Hoppy Quike beer, are there other brewers using Quike uh, for purposes outside of beers that would be a part of the constellation of traditional farmhouse beers. What we've seen in the US is like what Don was saying, and we have a lab here in Chicago, Omega, that um, has created a number of hybrid strains using uh, various uh, quike strains. And I'm just, and what people have done here in the States is typically make IPAs and beers that please the market in some way. And so I'm kind of curious is, uh, is to whether the yeast is or the style is uh, created for a larger market outside of what Nogne has done. Uh, yeah, there are um, a number of brewers who have used Quake in uh, non-traditional styles, like you were saying. And just as in the US, it's, it's been the most common to do it in, in IPA. Um, there is one exception, which is uh, this brewery that's called Eik Otid. Uh, means oak in time. Um, they make uh, they make beers that are well on, only they brew this way. Let's put it that way. So they make raw ales uh, usually with juniper infusion, but then they uh, make them sour with um, with quite. And that uh, 
the the acidity does something to the protein from from the unboiled wort so you get proteins that break down and you get these all the sort of um, umami like flavors uh, and they also ferment the beer down to be very dry so uh, it gives them kind of an uh how to how to put it it's kind of like uh it's they have a sort of canvas to to do other flavors on that that's unlike what anybody else is doing so that that's a super interesting brewery i think Don, anything from, from your end that you wanted to add to that? Um, no. <laughs> fair enough. Um, fair enough. Uh, let's go to um, a, a submitted question that we had. And Matt, I want to toss this over to you, which may connect to a uh, topic around tax reform um, within the UK. So the question was, have you seen any new conventional wisdom emerge in the craft brewing movement over the two plus years of the pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna have Matt address this first. Lucy, I'd love to hear about how this connects to South Africa as well. But Matt, you know, something like that, especially, you know, this could be styles. Uh, if it is, if this does fit with the way the tax reform or the way taxes will change for brewers, are there conversations that are happening right now in terms of ways that businesses have to think about what conventional wisdom means for the way that they did things before to the way they'll be doing things moving forward? So uh, how much time have we got? Um, <laughs> we've had a, beer in the UK is fascinating. It's, it's, um, we saw this explosion. We have a big beer scene. We have 2000 breweries. Uh, we're probably, uh, going to see a decline in breweries this year. Um, it, it's really tough out there um, in terms of, you know, it, a combination of the cost of running a business and uh, a dramatic reduction in disposable income for people who, who want to buy a luxury good like beer. But something that's ha really driven the growth of, of younger breweries over the last few years are um, dippers, tippers, New England IPA, pastry stouts, that sort of limited uh, relative scarcity. A lot of people, a lot of breweries have come out and done that and they've got quite big. They've installed big brew houses. They look, they have tap rooms. They look very American. And if you look at the beers these breweries are releasing now, they're releasing cask bitters. They're releasing porters. They're releasing uh, heritage grain milds. Um, the... <laughs> To use a Britishism, the the arse is falling out of these limited uh, scarcity beers. A load of Finback pastry stats came over to the UK a couple of weeks ago. In 2018, 2019, people would have queued around the block. I could walk down the, the street and buy one. Now they're still in stock. People, people are losing uh, the attention span for that kind of thing. And they are reconnecting with British brewing traditions, cask ale, uh, Guinness, have reported their sales up 33%. Lockdown really uh, reminded us of the value of the pub, the third space in the UK, and that is really influencing trends. I think that was happening already. Craft beer in the UK needed to define itself from this established scene. And now it's realized actually British beer culture is amazing and it's reconnecting with it. And it's, it's beautiful. Um, I wrote a book about it called Modern British Beer, which I encourage you to read. Um, but that's, so that's what's happening in terms of like the pub and the value of the pub um, and the value of a good pint of, of real ale, of lager. Um, you know, anecdotally, I was in one of my favorite bars in Manchester. They've got, they would normally have one dark beer on, they have three on now. And I, I said, how are they selling? And they said, we can't, we need to double up the amount of dark beer and, and mild we're ordering because suddenly people don't want to have a, a third of dipper. They want a pint of something uh, reassuring, uh, something to sip at. So that's really positive. In terms of taxation, this is going to further drive what I've just been talking about. So um, in the UK's annual budget uh, earlier this year, oh, sorry, it was late last year, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced a uh, uh, a complete reform of our very old, very complicated alcohol taxation laws. And previously, we had different laws for beer, wine, cider and spirits. And there's going to be one taxation for all alcohol, which is, and there's some, the detail, the finer points haven't been released. One point uh, that's very, 
that I've got my eye on is presently, if you brew a beer under 2.8%, you, you pay less tax. You, you get a dramatic reduction. That threshold is being raised to 3.5. And but the, the law allows a deviation of 0.5% for, um, for, for declaration purposes. So technically, you could brew a 3.9% beer, declare it as 3.4, pay less tax. This is going to be a huge driver for lower alcohol styles. And actually, I think this is great because that little bit of extra alcohol, a little bit of weight, a little bit of flavor, that, that could be really buoyant in terms of table beers. People are very mindful about alcohol consumption and the volume of al alcohol consumption once you get out of craft beer and into beer as a mainstream product. Um, interestingly enough though, the tax on beers above 8.5% is gonna be dramatically increased. Um, so we may see less double IPAs, less pastry stouts because they're gonna get more expensive the cost of barley is going up 50% this year. The cost of utilities to run a brewery, uh, the, the bills have tripled for some breweries this year. I think you're going to see what we haven't seen come out of a lot of the new wave of breweries is core beers. Where are the, the legacy beers? Where are the, where's the next landlord coming from? You know, um, I think a lot of the breweries that established themselves in the last five or 10 years are currently going, where do we, where's our legacy? How do we, uh, create a legacy you look to the us and all these new breweries and but without uh, building a platform for what what do the next 10 years look like so we're, we're in that time of flux the last detail i'll add on the taxation is there's a huge disparity between grocery and uh, pub beer prices uh, the supermarkets have driven beer down to the lowest possible price uh, whereas pubs cost cost a lot of money to run a pub these days so there's a huge disparity there's going to be a new tax break for draft beer um so we could see less disparity i think we if you look at the way if you put beer to one side if you look at towns like manchester london sheffield liverpool bristol hospitality businesses are replacing uh retailers high street stores hospitality is going to play a huge role in how we function as a society we're getting we're going back to being a people who go to the pub i think there's going to be this movement because the world's going to shit and we, we, like how do you process that you go to the pub you have a nice pint of bitter and you talk about it with your friends so that's i think that's a huge driver um for the next few years in british beer um and amid all that negativity, I think that's positive because the British pub is uh, an irreplaceable cultural institution. Uh, Lucy, uh, there has been a lot that has impacted Africa, South Africa over the course of the last couple of years um, with lockdowns, now access to ingredients, uh, the way that alcohol could or could not be sold. Um, when we think about what conventional wisdom means and the ways that brewers are maybe shifting what they're doing, what does that look like in South Africa? I think the big thing is people, a lot of people, you know, the, I mean, it was a really shitty time, obviously for everybody. We had, I can't really even remember now, but all put together, maybe six months or eight months, or something of, of complete alcohol ban like no sales, well, legally, no sales anyway, let's say. <laughs> there are plenty of sales. Um, but a lot of the brewers will acknowledge that there were positives that came out of the whole thing because it gave them time. So the first lockdown we had, they couldn't produce either. They couldn't go into them. They were allowed to go and check on beer that was already fermenting and that was it. They weren't allowed to brew. Um, but it gave people a lot of downtime to sort of, you know, think about business plans. And a lot of people have actually completely reassessed. What a lot of the smaller brewers are trying to do was uh, compete with some of our larger sort of distribution craft breweries. Distribution in South Africa is uh, mm. very difficult. We don't really have any uh, um, like independent distributors and the bigger breweries that we sort of dominate tap space is very difficult. So a lot of people reassessed and decided to go back to what, you know, what small breweries always, you know, used to be, or maybe still are in, the, in Germany, for example, where they're focusing completely on their local um market they're not distributing at all in some cases you, if you want the beer you go buy from the brewery whether it's cans or growlers or just a pint so i think a lot of people have actually um i was at a brewery yesterday and he was trying to get bigger and bigger and he was studying distributing and during lockdown he completely pulled back 
and now it's only available from his brewery. I was at his brewery yesterday, it was pumping, um, you know, and, and, and it's busy, it's all the time, and it's got a huge following, you know, he does a lot of events with the local homebrewers and that kind of thing, and he's very much focusing on the local community. So I think that was one way that, um, that the whole lockdown thing, you know, just gave people a chance to just take a step back and look at their business and say, actually, this isn't working, how about we try this? Um, you know, and, and realizing that distribution and set that up, well, anywhere really, it's not like the money is in brew pubs, right? Direct to, to public. But we have a lot of problems with um, with tap space and shelf space. You know, I mean, for so many years, SAB has, which is at the South African breweries, it's now in by ABI, but completely dominated and still completely dominates, like 90 something percent of all beer sold. Um, and it's just very difficult for a craft brewer to get into a bar or a restaurant or a, or a liquor store. So yeah, I think that was one good thing that came out of, of um, <laughs> and you know, just help people to survive. At one point they were predicting that, I, I can't even remember now, it was like up to 80% of breweries could close. And we've actually had more like 5% of closed. And, and to be completely honest, all of them should have closed already. In fact, in a couple of cases, I was surprised they were closing because I thought they were long since closed. <laughs> so, you know, it was the guys who sort of maybe didn't have that passion and everybody else kept reinventing themselves. And, and it, it's, things are looking quite positive in South Africa now, in beer at least. <laughs> um, Don, I want to direct this question that we had submitted towards you um, because I, I think, and I, I'm certainly guilty of some of this thinking as well in the past, when we think about uh, broader trends and what's going on with the way that people think about and drink beer uh, in America, we're just making an assumption that like our friends to the North uh, might just, it might just be an extension there. Um, and the question that we had was how are taste preferences for beer different abroad than comparatively in the US or other established craft beer markets. And I, I would like it maybe because Matt, you hit on this a little bit. I'll ask all of you, but Don, I do want to start with you just maybe reflecting on um, if there are similarities or differences when we think about what's going on, whether it's near you in Calgary or Canada as a whole um, with interest in, in beer styles and the beer market compared to the US. Um. I think that we are, uh, culturally, Canada is very driven by America. Uh, certainly, you know, New England IPA uh, and that sort of thing, though, uh, very, very popular here. Um, having said that, you know, Canadians tend to be kind of quietly proud uh, of Canada as well. We are very, very proud of, of our barley, as I mentioned earlier. And so I, I do think that you will see more malt driven beers here than in america but only slightly so i don't think um i don't think there's dramatic differences between the um the flavor profiles um in between canadian and american beer mm. um lars we'll go to you i'm going to post this question in the chat box so everyone can see it too generally how are taste preferences for beer different uh, how does this strike you when you think about what's going on in norway lars uh, it sounds quite similar. Um, we've had this wave of uh, New England IPAs and pastry stouts and, and all of that stuff as well. And when you go into bars or you go into the alcohol monopoly, um, you know, it's just rows and rows of different IPAs. Um, I think maybe the biggest difference uh, that I've seen is that uh, hard seltzer doesn't seem to be a thing here at all, um, thankfully. <laughs> Lucy, you had said that with the uh, with the beer cup, that two of the highest entered categories, I believe you said, were lager and pale ale. Is that correct? How yeah. so? Um, it, it, whether that's not a, a reflection or not, but are are there taste differences in terms of what you see uh, around South Africa compared to maybe what's going on with the U.S. Um, on the whole, I think people are less adventurous here. Uh, like a tiny in South Africa, probably uh, ninety-eight point five percent of the population have never had a craft beer. I'm just completely making that statistic up, but it's craft beer is is, is tiny. Um, sorry, saying my connection is 
unstable. I don't know if you, if I'm still, <laughs> I'm wondering if my data is running out now. Um, Logger is is very much king in South Africa, you know, and so for most, the vast majority of the craft breweries, they offer a pale lager of some of some kind, or at least a blonde ale or something, so that when people come in and they say, what do you have that tastes closest to Castle Light, which is like our Bud Light, um, then they've got something to try and draw them in. And if you don't have that beer, and you know, if you, some of the very small, like Soul Barrel, which is, I, I put in the chat earlier, they're doing a lot of weird stuff, good weird. Um, but they're very niche and very like come to us. You, if you go there, it's because you're, you, you're seeking them out. But for the most part, you know, breweries that actually want to make some money, uh, you've got to have a pale lager or something very similar in your, in your stable. Otherwise you can't win people over. Um, Matt, you, you, I think you hit on this question in a way already talking about some of those changes, but just in case there was anything else to add, when you think about, um, changing or difference in taste preferences. Anything else uh, from your end? I just think, you know, using this chance of talking to American beer writers, it's important to remember that the UK is 72% of our market is owned by five breweries. And you will know those names. It's it's uh, Heineken, Molson Coors, AB InBev, uh, Asahi. And Euro Lager is still the best-selling style of beer. Guinness is on the up. There's a, there's a romanticism about Guinness here, but um, actually Diageo, uh, it buys up taps, especially in Ireland. Um, you know, it's very difficult for craft. I mean, that's a completely different market again. Um, and the largest cask ale in, in the UK by some distance, Doombar, it's a Molson Coors product. Um, and it kind of, and that kind of distorts um, the figures, Carlsberg and Molson Coors being the two largest cask ale producers. And the news says that Cascale is in double digit decline. Um, and if you look at Doom Bar and brands like uh, Hobgoblin or, or Old Speckled Hen, those brands are in decline. Uh, but I spoke to a small uh, London brewer called Five Points, their cask sales are 25% up. Mm. They're using hops direct from a hop farm. I speak to Red Willow here in Macclesfield, they're making more lager and Cascale than they ever have. And they're an IPA brewery. They, they established themselves in 2010 to make American IPAs. And I went to visit their brewery yesterday and they had five lagers in tank and they were brewing heritage ESBs and heritage miles with, with heritage barley and they can't make them fast enough. So there is a reconnection happening. Drinkers, craft beer drinkers are maturing, accepting that real ale and craft beer have been the same thing all along, spaceman meme. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I derailed my own train of thought there. <laughs> So I'm positive, like, it's a really tough time. We're going we're gonna to see 60 to 100 breweries close minimum in the UK this year. It's, it's shit. It's, there's no money. Uh, no one's got any money. It's really expensive to, to run a business. But uh, the pubs are great. The beer's great. We've also got, like, no COVID rules, so, like, it, which is crazy. So come and visit. Uh, I'll take you to the pub. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'll pause in case anybody else has a question. Uh, maybe we'll start to wrap things up here. But I do the I do want to flag this thing that I'm hearing from all of you. And we're talking with people, different spots around the globe. And we've heard multiple references about, you know, high ABV IPAs, pastry stouts, which is, I think we can identify as a very popular big American thing and the at least interest or curiosity that exists elsewhere in the world for this very um, contemporary approach uh, to those styles. But at the same time, from I think from all of you, I am hearing about the increased interest in, um, maybe not just traditional aspects of drinking and drinking culture, but familiar cultural connections, connections with people. And these stories can exist separately, but it, they are existing at the same time too, running parallel to each other, uh, which I find really interesting that while somebody may still be interested in a double IPA or a vanilla bean marshmallow 12% stout, um, the idea of going to a local brewery to get the beer directly from the people or the pub to meet your friend um, is increasing too. So I do just want to make sure that I kind of like underline that for everybody too, as we think about what we've heard today. Um, I will pause one last time. If you have a question for any uh, anybody, if you please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. We'll do that and then kind of wrap up. I'll give you a... Hello. Ah, yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, for Matt. 
Uh, how do we reconcile the, the revived interest in pubs with the high rise in the price of a pint? Just check the time. Um, <laughs> um, that's a, uh, so personal uh, national insurance, a personal tax we pay in the UK is going up this month. So it's interesting. I think we are trying to reconcile that because something I have argued for previously with, let's talk about Cascale, uh, is premiumization. With, with craft beer, American style craft beer, it brought premiumization of certain products to the market. Um, and a lot of people, including myself, have said that is what will save that 50p more and a pint, make it more special. Um, I moved to, but I lived in London. I had a very London centric perspective. I now live in the north of England where the pint, the cast pint is, is for everyone. It's utilitarian. I actually think premiumization would destroy the market. But I actually think that, um, what the cost of living crisis we're going through is, is actually going to drive more people to the pub, to, to the old school British pub where the beer is cheap and brewers are going to have to put more impetus. This is why they're shifting away back to more traditional styles because of the turnover. If they're selling casks quickly, then they might not be making as much money, but if they can sell more beer, then that turnover is going to keep the lights on. Um, so we reconcile it, uh, I think, by going to the pub and, drinking lots of pints of 4% bitter. Um, that, that's, that's it. Um, I'm doing my part. <laughs> I hope that answers uh, your question. It's, it's tough to do if like in London, if there are six to seven pounds of pint. I mean, just, gone just are the few, days, yeah. When I used to go there, it'd be, you know, Weatherspoons was 99p a pint. So just, just, just as a guide, like I, I, you know, if you want a pint of IPA in central Manchester, it could be between seven and 10 pounds. In central Manchester, a pint of cask will be four or five pounds, depending on ABV. But if I go to a suburban pub, I can get a pint for three pounds. And I'm not going to, and it was going to those pubs that made me, and it's the same beer, and realize if you go into this pub and make it four pounds, you'll have half as many customers. Um, and I think it's, if you do get to the UK, try and get it like central London is not is L London and the UK are very different. London is its own Island in, within an Island. It's not reflective of what the wider, wider UK is like. Um, so, and, and moving North a couple of years ago really helped me realize that. So um, yeah, if you go to a village, a nice village pub and say, well, this is going to be five pound a pint. Now you won't have a village pub anymore because no one will go. So yeah, it was a good question. Yeah, my, my boys are <clears throat> from uh, the borough. So Little Borough, Rochdale, Bury. So, so I'm familiar with the prices there. So <laughs> thanks. Uh, I am going to, for one last plug, I'm going to put uh, the social media handles for our four guests um, in the chat box. Uh, that's Matt, Lucy, Don, and Lars in order that you'll see there. Um, thank you so much to all four of you for sharing your uh, mornings e and evenings uh, with us. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for sharing your morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you're, you're checking in from as well. Um, this has been really great. Um, I will sure to talk to you all soon enough. Uh, if you want to continue this conversation, uh, in our email that went out today, we do plug our Slack channel, uh, where you can jump on straight from here if you so wish to continue the conversation. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you to everybody for being here and tuning in. I will see you all soon enough. Be well, everybody. Take care.